This is the Aberdeen Proving Ground, the Army Test and Evaluation Command's most comprehensive engineering testing and evaluation center. 75,000 acres of modern data gathering facilities and test ranges, located near the upper Chesapeake Bay in Northern Maryland. Here concentrated in the organization known as Development and Proof Services, military and civilian engineers and supporting personnel subject materiel of all types to rigorous test procedures. Their mission, to provide an objective engineering evaluation service for Army Commodity Commands, arsenals, private contractors, and to the other military services and government agencies as well. The final goal is to make certain the soldiers of the United States Army are equipped with the world's best weapons. D and PS evaluation activities covers a wide range of capabilities, from tests of the accuracy of small arms under varying conditions, to an analysis of the breakup characteristics of a giant missile. With tests of all types and varieties of vehicles, weapons, and conventional ammunition in between. As important as facilities and tests are, they are only tools in the hands of experienced people. And it is the people of DNPS at Aberdeen that represent the most important single asset of the command, desiring objective evaluation testing of materiel. You see, Aberdeen is the Army's senior test and evaluation center. Our engineers here can draw upon nearly 50 years of experience with Army equipment of all types. Over the years, they have acquired the depth of knowledge required to plan and conduct engineering evaluation that will take the shortest possible time, cost the customer the least amount of money, and yet provide the detailed performance data required. One man of particular importance in the DNPS engineering evaluation procedure is the test engineer. He is a man with a breadth of professional experience in testing and evaluating military weapons, backed up by skilled supporting personnel in every specialty area often months before the first test on a given vehicle or weapon is conducted, our test engineer is given the responsibility of test director. From then on, he is in charge of planning the most efficient and effective test plan, using as his guide a set of standard test procedures established by the personnel at Aberdeen and qualitative material requirements, QMR, previously established for each development item. Then he must coordinate all D and PS activities involved in the test plan to see that it is carried out and the desired information is obtained. The evaluation procedures begin as soon as the test item arrives at Aberdeen. The first requirement of a D and PS evaluation procedure is a careful examination of the test item itself. This initial inspection permits the test engineer to learn the condition of materiel before engineering testing starts, so he can be certain it is adjusted correctly for proper performance, and so he can have a set of quantitative standards to measure his test results against. In the automotive evaluation area, experienced mechanics inspect such items as the engine to be sure it is functioning up to standard. They measure such functioning characteristics as manifold pressure, combustion or injector performance, temperatures, exhaust pressure, lubrication, and fuel flow. Thus, the basic functioning of the vehicle is correctly established for measurements of engineering data such as speed, acceleration, grade climbing ability, and fuel consumption. Other ancillary components, such as the fixed fire extinguisher system in the engine compartment, are also inspected and functioned to determine performance parameters. Any malfunctions are corrected by experienced mechanics and baseline conditions are established before testing starts. So when the vehicle leaves the shop for testing, the engineer knows it is functioning properly. Now it is time to see if it can meet the operating requirements specified.
This is determined by engineering performance measured on established test courses and obstacles. In this Munson test area, there are 32 courses and obstacles designed to measure vehicle performance parameters. The vehicle must be able to move through loose sand without losing traction, yet maintain adequate steering control. Sand is only one type of prepared terrain used for determining mobility. Adverse natural terrain conditions are also used to verify mobility. The ability of a vehicle to ford rivers and streams reduces its dependence on bridges and greatly facilitates speed during strategic movement. The vehicle's mobility is also evaluated against test obstacles. One is the trench, where front and rear interferences are noted. Here, the towing eye does not seriously impede the progress of the vehicle when going over the standard trench. The wall climb is another test obstacle. All combat vehicles must be able to climb walls of specified heights. Here, the engineer has a practical measurement of the effect of the approach angle, center of gravity, weight distribution, and low speed power. The test engineer is also interested in knowing the length of free span a vehicle can cross. Here again, weight distribution and locations of the center of gravity are influencing factors, together with suspension design. The effect of center of gravity location, weight distribution, and suspension design can be evaluated here. The crucial test of track vehicle performance is the hill climb the ability to climb a grade of specified slope and speed. Here the test engineer can learn how the vehicle meets speed specifications, how well the brakes stop the vehicle, how the parking brakes hold, how the engine as well as fuel and lubrication systems perform at these attitudes. The tank must be under complete control in both ascending or descending attitudes. All of these factors must be considered in evaluating the ability of the vehicle to meet design specifications. Wheeled vehicles, too, are subjected to the standard obstacles in the DNPS automotive test areas. The frame twister course subjects the vehicle frame body and suspension to the most severe stress conditions. Functioning parts must be free of interferences during this test. Tests on this side slope of 40% enables test engineers to determine vehicle stability, steering performance, and functioning of fuel and lubrication systems. Side slopes of 20% and 30% are also used for vehicles with lesser stability requirements. Brake tests not only determine ability to stop, but also stability of the vehicle during severe brake application. Deceleration characteristics assist in analyzing faulty brake performance. To define the dynamic behavior, accelerometers are placed at sensitive locations on the vehicle. As the truck is driven over the bump courses, data from these sensing elements are transmitted by a radio link to a telemetry receiving station. Here, they are recorded and stored on magnetic tape. Later, they are processed through automatic reduction equipment, which provides statistical descriptions of the dynamic environment. 
These results are extremely important in evaluating the structural integrity of the vehicle and its components. Large amplitude vibration at low frequencies can be studied on the sinusoidal washboard course. The two-inch washboard road subjects the vehicle to higher frequency vibrations. The Belgian blocks give the vehicle both low frequency random pitch and roll and relatively high frequency vibration. Finally, the embedded rock course shows how a vehicle behaves on rough terrain, such as certain portions of World War II's Burma Road. Other engineering data that must be collected includes dynamometer measurements of drawbar pull, which is power excess to that required to move the vehicle. This is a measure of power available for acceleration, towing, hill climbing, and operation in sand or mud. The field dynamometer is the means of obtaining this information. The strain gauge drawbar measures towing forces exerted by the test vehicle. The speed and load are controlled by the amount of power absorbed by the electric generators in the dynamometer truck and auxiliary trailers. The significance of drawbar data is enhanced by concurrent measurements of engine speed, vehicle speed, track slippage, fuel consumption, and engine and transmission temperatures. Engine temperatures, for example, are measured by thermocouples attached at critical points and connected to an automatic recorder. Temperature measurements serve to monitor the severity of test conditions and help the engineer understand abnormal behavior or failure of mechanical, hydraulic, and electrical systems. Following engineering performance testing under control conditions, the test engineer puts the vehicle in a series of tests to determine durability and reliability. While the Perryman test area is essentially level, the Churchville test areas consist of a series of cross-country courses with hills of varying severity. There are no level areas. These courses are particularly suited for stressing engine and powertrain components. The engineer determines the severity of the test course based on the vehicle performance requirements and the seasonal variations in mud and dust conditions. This Perryman test area consists of a series of cross-country courses of graduated severity from that equivalent to secondary roads to that more severe than expected in service. Cross-country test courses are used to evaluate such factors as the effectiveness of air cleaners, abrasive effects on mechanical parts, and the effect on cruise vision. For vehicles designed with a swimming capability, DNPS has the Chesapeake Bay at its disposal for test purposes. At the conclusion of drive testing, a study of various critical parts of the vehicle engine reveals the degree of wear and deterioration. This analysis, together with the kind and degree of maintenance required throughout the test, provide the basis for judging the merits of the vehicle. Low temperature testing is another area of interest to the test engineer. 
In addition to large permanent cold room facilities, he has the benefit of portable cold chambers operated with liquid carbon dioxide. Of course, the purpose of a fighting vehicle is to deliver firepower. So, the test engineer schedules certain firing tests to evaluate accuracy, rate of fire, effectiveness, human factors, and even such things as ammunition stowage, fumes, noise, internal communication, and safety. All the factors that make up the composite system that is a tank. At one DMPS firing range, a radio-controlled target operates on a closed triangular rail course at speeds from 2 to 45 miles an hour. It permits firing at a target moving at various angles, ranges, and velocities relative to the weapon system being tested. Thus, the most difficult firing problems can be simulated and the accuracy of the weapons measured. Here, the test engineer can observe what effect the severe shock and vibration of driving tests has had on the alignment of the sighting devices and the weapon itself. That gives you an idea of the depth of facilities and breadth of experience applied to the engineering evaluation of automotive vehicles by development of proof services at Aberdeen. All of this enables the test engineer to accumulate the engineering data he needs in the shortest possible time. Now see how this similar experience is applied to another area. Once again, the test engineer assigned to a particular item is responsible for the planning of the test and evaluation procedure, and then coordinating all the DNPS facilities and personnel to see that the required engineering information is obtained. As with automotive vehicles, the sequence is begun when the test item arrives at Aberdeen. Heavy artillery moves into the DNPS area on special railroad siding. After unloading, it is towed into the artillery shop, where it is inspected for soundness and dimensions, lubricated and reassembled. Thus, the test engineer can acquire all the information he needs about the weapons to form the basis of comparison after engineering testing. A typical inspection procedure includes magnafluxing to locate any surface flaws, bore scoping to check for flaws inside the barrel, and star gauging to measure the barrel diameter both in the grooves and on the land to the nearest thousandth of an inch. Trammel points are established on critical areas of the mount to measure any permanent strain after firing. And strain gauges are attached to measure the strain during firing. A hole is drilled in the spindle of the obturator pad assembly, so a gauge can be inserted to measure propellant pressure. The hole is step-threaded and precisely machined, so there will be no leakage, even though propellant pressure may reach 50,000 pounds per square inch or higher. Seals of the recoil mechanism are inspected and critical dimensions checked before the mechanism is reassembled. A gauge to measure pressure time history of the recoil mechanism fluid is inserted into one of the access ports. When the gun is reassembled, ready for firing, the test engineer has the information he needs as a beginning to the engineering evaluation procedures. Meanwhile, test ammunition of a type required by the test plan is assembled in DNPS's high explosive assembly plant. Where small quantities of HE shell are required, components may be assembled and the shell loaded at the proving ground to expedite the test. X-ray of the loaded shell assures the test engineer that there are no major cavities that could cause a premature explosion in the gun barrel. This will also assure that the quality will compare favorably with that from an arsenal or a production facility. X-ray and Cobalt-60 equipment plays an important part in other testing. For example, 
spotting defects in armor plate, and checking the condition of test ammunition after test firing in the field. Loading the propelling charge to obtain the highest permissible pressure within the gun design limits is a standard procedure to check weapon design. Here, a rayon bag contains the propellant for this particular round. Multi-perforated cylinders of a composite of nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin. When inspection and ammunition preparation is complete, the weapon is driven to the range area for firing tests. After emplacement, the projectile is hydraulically rammed. The propelling charge is loaded and the weapon is ready to fire. Operating personnel conduct pressure and strain gauges which provide data used to study interior ballistics and to assure that design limits are not exceeded. An instrument trailer containing tape recorders and oscilloscopes is used to pick up and record firing data. A smooth pressure time history indicates a safe propellant ignition system. But if the curve is significantly irregular in the rise portion, the test engineer knows there is a probability of the gun blowing up. Average velocity of the projectile will be recorded as a function of the time it takes to pass by two sky screens positioned in front of the gun. Repeated test firings provide enough data to accurately assess the performance of the weapon being tested. In this physical test laboratory, Causes for material failures are determined. The engineer may request applicable services any time during the testing procedure. Here, dynamic unbalance is being taken. If the engineer needs answers to questions concerning the physical properties of the test item, the physical test laboratory makes the analysis and provides him with the requested data. On a special DMPS over the water firing range, the test engineer evaluates air burst performance of the projector. An infrared optical pickup is connected to a chronograph and positioned behind the gun. Thus, muzzle flash and the projectile burst are in the same field of view, and the accuracy of the timing mechanism in the fuse can be measured. By firing over water, the engineer has an unobstructed view from the weapon to the point of burst can observe fuse function when it occurs. Test observers in towers also take transit readings on each burst. This is a requirement when making range tables. Atmospheric conditions that can affect range to impact or air burst are measured by radio sound equipment carried aloft by balloon. Temperature, pressure, and humidity data are radioed back while radar tracking of the balloon determines wind velocity. High resolution photos are taken near the muzzle. A high speed shutterless camera enables the test engineer to determine if the projectile has been damaged in launching. An ultra high speed framing camera is set up to photograph the motion of the gun tube with respect to the vehicle as the projector leaves the muzzle and the weapon recoils. Muzzle blast is a potential source of vehicle damage or even injury to operating personnel. Various types of pressure sensing devices are positioned at critical points on and about the vehicle to detect and record pressure intensity and duration.
shell is placed in the center of an arena made up of target panels and surrounded by equipment to record velocities. This is an important means of acquiring lethality data used in determining if the shell meets the anti-personnel requirements. When the shell is exploded, the fragments pass through the panels and light from flash bulbs behind is visible. Cameras record the light from which the speed of the fragments can be calculated. The fragments are recovered, cleaned and weighed. You have seen tests on an artillery system. Now a few glimpses of tests on other systems will illustrate the wide variety of capabilities DNPS has in testing other systems. Here you see tests on a missile system mounted on an aircraft. Prior to flight testing, ground test phases are conducted. Particular attention is given to tests such as vibration, extreme temperatures, rain, sand and dust, and drop safety tests. After the ground testing phases, the missiles are subjected to operational and firing tests. In this test, they are fired and guided by the gunner who is in the aircraft's co-pilot seat. On this half-mile ballistic track, the engineer can determine if test items meet performance requirements under carefully controlled but realistic dynamic test conditions. For the Atomic Energy Commission, this instrumented rocket sled will carry granite impact targets into preheated fuel capsules. These especially constructed ovens are synchronized to fall away from the capsule when the sled is fired. At the impact area, high-speed cameras record deformation, acceleration, and other effects of impact on the heated capsule. Ballistic track tests have saved many thousands of dollars and much precious time in the engineering tests of weapon systems. In this helicopter armament system, consisting of high firing rate machine guns and rockets, the engineer, after closely coordinated instrumented checkout and ground firing tests, uses a predetermined flight test plan to confirm the design functioning, safety, varying firing rates, including salvo and jettisoning features of the system. Of course, the purpose of all these tests is to acquire information. Then, analysis and evaluation must take place. And this is a particularly important area where the experience of DNPS personnel pays off. DNPS has people skilled in the translation of various test data work to reduce it to a form that is meaningful to the test engineer. Modern electronic equipment helps them to do this job rapidly and accurately. Upon completion of tests and data analysis, a formal report is submitted. Engineering tests are tough here at Development of Proof Services at Aberdeen. But then, these weapons have a tough job to do. Only those that meet the objective DNPS test standards move on into production and out into the battlefield. It has often been said that the Army with the superior weapons will win the battle. And the people at DNPS at Aberdeen are proud of the job they are doing, making sure that America's fighting men are backed up with the finest weapons it is possible to build. <laughs>